audible? All right, good morning. Good morning to everybody. Good morning to all my students here and online, as well as all of those who've joined um, on the e-learning portal. All right, um, just to remind all the students, online students, that the, um, the assignment is due today. I know nine people have, uh, have um, submitted, but there are six more to submit. Today's your last day, so all those of you who have not submitted, Submitted. Oh, okay. Right. Please do submit. All right. Okay. Um, so let's have a quick recap about what we did last week. Who's the brave one who wants to start? Thank you. Are you not able to see my screen yet? Are you able to see the screen? Yeah, I think now you're able to see, right? OK. All right. So what did we focus on last week? It's not fair, because my online, my in-person students are here, only they get to speak. I'd like some of the online students to, to speak. Sorry, say that again? Stages. OK, so we looked at the stages. So which stage did we look at last week? Three stages are there. Very good. So what did we look at last week? The first stage, which is? Exploration. Exploration. OK. So understanding and action. And so we said we'll do the second and the third stage today. But quickly, to um, do a quick recap, so we said that there are Francis, there are three stages. OK. In, in stage one, we divided into two. One is the assessment and the problem identification, right? So for the assessment, you focus on 10 basic areas, right? We spoke about that, all right? Again, remember that uh, it's not a hard and fast rule that you have to do assessment first and then go into identification. It can all be done together. OK, then we spoke about, OK, we spoke about a case. We'll come back to this case just to refresh our memories. OK, Dennis's case, we'll come back to it. But we, uh, when, when, when someone comes to us, the first thing that we need to do is to identify the problem. And you identify the problem first and foremost, as they're talking about the problem, it is to clarify the feelings. So, yeah, so you're acknowledging the feelings of the person. As you're doing that, you're also looking at what is the problem behavior. In Dennis's case, the problem behavior was alcohol, right? Alcohol, not being able to go to college, be, uh, getting into problems with the, with the uh, teachers, with the professors, right? So we found, uh, we looked at the feelings, and generally his feelings were disappointment, was anger, we see the problem behavior was alcohol and his ability to uh, deal with the with the uh, with those in college once we did that what else would be identify what are the wrong beliefs that he was holding right and what were some of the wrong beliefs that we said that alcohol would help him get over that disappointment or that uh, it was one way of getting back to his father Right? So we, as an example, we saw that. So to identify his wrong beliefs. Why is it important to identify the wrong beliefs? So then we can uh, initiate one to one. Excellent. Very good. Good. Yeah. So we remember we did the A, B, C, D, E model. So for us, it's important for us to understand the beliefs or the wrong um, ideas so that you can help him dispute it. In your ABCD model, the D, you can help him dispute that belief or the thoughts that he may be having, OK? Then is in problem identification, help him personalize the problem. What's personalize the problem? He takes responsibility for his problem. Right now over here, what was he doing? He was blaming his father. So in a way to help him uh, uh, come to identify 
that the problem is his own, that his contribution is part of it. So how he is a part of that problem. So that's what we, that's the uh, next thing we looked at. The next is, how do we personalize the problem and the goal together? So the problem is that uh, he's turning into alcohol and the goal is to be able to get out of it or pursue a certain dream. So this was what we dealt with last week. Any thoughts, any questions before we get to the next one? Any thoughts? Yes, yes, Francis. So it it really depends, like for example, when Again, remember I said it's not a suggestion you are making, but let's say he says uh, one that that he wants to be able to talk to his father. Maybe that's something that he's come up with. So there are two things you can do. So if you can help him to do it on his own, right? So you may get into a conversation of how he's going to do it. And that's what you will look at action. The third part is action, right? So you may come to a place of uh, empowering him to do that right if he feels he's able if he feels he's not able he may say i don't i'm not confident about it i'd like to bring him here so he may suggest and say that he'd like to bring his father here so then you help him to um, bring his father here maybe discuss and talk about the issue so that he'll bring his father here so there is no set way it really depends on what the person the counselee would like to do Right? So he may say, I want to talk to my father, or he may say, I don't want to talk to my father, I want to deal it first on my own. Or he may say that, uh, you know, I'd, I can't talk to him, I'd like him to come here so all of us can talk together in your presence. So any of that is possible. In this case, we see like he's cooperating with the counselor. Yeah. But some cases, like, one person is going through a situation, ah. but the person thinking is not a problem, but somebody put it into your accounts, uh, like you should go to proper accounts. So, how to manage? So, he is not willing, you're saying? Like, okay. Hmm. I did something against the class. I said something against the class. The class is that he gave me counseling, then it became a big argument. You know, I the counseling. I said something like that. So, like in that kind of situation, like one person not need compensating, mm. as he's thinking, mm. and people are asking the counseling. Correct. Right. Yeah. So one of the things is it the the person who's coming for counseling should be willing to sit in front of the counselor. Otherwise, you may come on force of somebody, maybe for the first time, and then never land up. Right. So uh, so that's why you can't uh, you can't force someone to take support and help you can suggest you can you can recommend but it has to come from the person's willingness yeah is there chance that if someone comes by force and by our skills we can make him to come that's the idea Right, so that depends on how uh, all of your skills, not just the way that you counsel, even the way that you, um, you know, you build a rapport with them, really matters. Like for example, and we are going to be looking at that a little later, you know, uh, and so we can do some of those role plays for you to understand how that happens. So, but just to give you a quick brief, if there's someone who's coming and you know is being forced by a parent or someone so one of the questions i would ask him is i know how uncomfortable it can be when you're pushed to get counseling or help isn't it so what does the counselee see that that i understand what you're going through right yeah right and so i said yeah you know maybe even i wouldn't be very happy being pushed like that isn't it so what have i done i'm immediately building a rapport from my understanding, right? But I'm not advising him and saying, you know, your father is very upset with you and you should take counseling. Otherwise, you know, 
I've lost him then and there. Correct, right? So it is through your skills that you help them want to come back. Okay, and we will look at that in, in detail later. Okay, any other questions? Anything else from the online students? Okay, all right. Okay, so we'll move into stage two, which is understanding. <clears throat> okay, now uh, if you're following through on your uh, notes, we are at page 26. Okay, 26. <laughs> So the first thing that you would want to do, um, so what are the sum, some of the goals that in your, um, you know, in your assessment you have figured out? What are some of the goals? What do you think in Dennis's? Oh, you want to go back to Dennis's case once again? So we can have a quick, I'll just read Dennis's case once more. Okay. Dennis is a 19-year-old doing his second year of engineering. He was recently found drinking alcohol on college grounds. When confronted about it by a professor, he became extremely argumentative and aggressive and was suspended as a result. Dennis has a history of getting into trouble at college for missing classes, failing to complete assignments and general rudeness to professors. A number of professors have reported being concerned about David's health and well-being and have stated that they were sure that they had smelt alcohol on his breath on several different occasions. They also have noticed a deterioration in his college work as well as his general demeanor. Dennis was referred to a counselor for his drinking and behavior problem. He has admitted that he has been drinking quite a lot and sometimes by himself to get away from things. A number of, prof uh, sorry, um, life areas reveal that Dennis had difficulty in coping with academics, his father's expectations of him fulfilling his dreams of becoming an engineer. He resented his father for this because he secretly desired to be part of a rock band. David was forced to join an engineering college. He was unable to apply his mind to studies, alcohol became his escape reality. Okay, so that's the... That, uh, oh, sorry. However, Dennis doesn't see that there is a problem with his drinking and believes that the professors should mind their own business. Okay, so we've we've come to that place of where Dennis has discussed what he's feeling, what his beliefs are, right, and um, uh, what 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 the goal is. All right. So when you look at the next phase, it is you are going to set certain goals, which means when, uh, for example, when you're faced with any kind of a problem, what is the first thing that you need to do to solve the problem? Yeah, which is what we did. We identified the problem. After that, after you identify the problem, okay, that comes all under exploration, right? When it comes to understanding you, what the first thing that you're doing is you have to keep certain goals. Like, for example, like last time Francis said, my problem is that I am distracted. Right? He said the problem is a distraction. So what is the goal? To be focused. Right? That becomes the goal. Isn't it? Right? So usually the goal is usually opposite of the problem. And so when a counselee comes to you, the opposite of this problem will be your goal. And so what would be some of the goals that from what you heard or what you understood from his from the uh, first class, from, uh, from the exploration, what are some of the goals? Okay, so the goal is to probably find another mechanism to cope rather than alcohol. Okay, then... That is alcohol, no? Which are the behavior? Okay. Uh, yeah, so... Okay. Right, so he has an alternate uh, desire or an alternate, uh, what do you say, um, goal. Right? So that can be a goal. 
What else? Belief system? Yeah. What does he believe? His father. That his father, he's probably uh, like a revenge for his father, right? So it's a belief. So is that a goal? To help him change that belief? Is that a goal? Yeah, because you may be able to get him to rehabilitation or get him to sit in class, but if, if his thoughts do not change, you're not sustaining it for too long, isn't it? Right. What else? What could be any other goal? To have to, yeah. So we said a rock band uh, uh, thing is a, is a goal for him. We also. Okay, so that again is, yeah, so that may be a goal. So that again, remember that the goals are generally what you work alongside with the counselee and formulate. It's not your goals, right? Remember, it's not your goals. You may have 10 goals, but he may not be willing to use those goals. So what you're doing is to coming him to a place to make useful goals that will help transformation, that will help change. All right. OK, your goals are also one of the goals that we did see when we looked at the first chapter, understanding human needs. What did we say are the most crucial needs of a person? S secure, significant, and value, right? Self, Self-esteem, security, and significance, right? So. We find that his sense of value or his sense of significance has been moved to something else. What is it? Alcohol at this point of time, right? So to question that. So that also is a goal to help him see that his value doesn't come from maybe a profession or value doesn't come from what his father expects of him, but there is inherent value, right? So the, these, are, these are maybe more deeper things that may remain as a goal, okay? So the first thing that you would need to do is to help your counselee change the problem-causing beliefs. What are the problem-causing beliefs? That The example given here, alcohol cannot take away my pain, or following a dream alone will not make me fulfilled, significant, worthwhile. So these may be certain beliefs he is holding, that when I, my identity comes from me being a rock star, or Alcohol is the one that will take away my pain. So that has become his belief system. So what is the first goal that you have is to help them alter that belief system. Okay, Getting them to a place to change the belief system so that they are in line with truth. In line with truth. That alcohol cannot take away my pain. And that is true. Alcohol cannot take pain, but he needs to deal with the pain or the emotion that he's experiencing. Okay, So that becomes the first goal through the, uh, as you, as you're, as you're doing that. So how do you uh, do that? There is a process, remember the ABCD model. Okay, so what do you first do? Sorry? Say that again. Ah, so that is that is later. Before that, yeah. So you identified the beliefs in the last one, right? So what you are doing is once you identify the belief, the next thing that you will do is to help him dispute it, help him dispute that belief. So here, how do you change wrong beliefs? First of all, identify, re-identify, or bring it back again that that wrong belief, and then you dispute the wrong belief and then replace it with a true belief right so that's what you're doing uh, as you as it will be the biggest goal that you have the first goal is to change the thoughts because the thoughts is what creates your emotions remember we learned that you're in a situation your thoughts creates your emotions your emotions make it make your behavior so the first thing that you will do is to change those wrong beliefs. So first is identify the belief, dispute the belief, and replace it with a true belief. OK? Um, you have a question? Yeah. We, we know that like, it's not we should be telling, but we should be questioning and making them to come to the place of it. Yeah. So when uh, replacing with a true belief, there also we can't tell it, right? Like, 
this is the right belief. You should like this is your wrong thing, mm. and this is the right thing. You mm. can't say it. Like Correct. That. Huh. But what if uh, again from wrong belief they went to another wrong belief? So that's where you continue to bring it like a question. Yes, yes. Till they come to a place of understanding. And so that may not happen in 10 minutes. There are sometimes it takes three, four sessions till they come to that place. Okay. But that's what your questioning does. It really helps them to think about their own beliefs. Like so, and simple questions like, um, you know, you were telling me that, uh, I mean, from from your from your situation, I see that you feel alcohol will make you get rid of your pain or your disappointment. What do you think about that, right? Or how long do you think that's going to help you? So that's how you get them to think, all right? Or you could you could ask something like, if uh, you know, alcohol no more could take away your pain and your belief. What else would you do to help you deal with that pain? So, and then they're thinking, right? And they're saying, okay, maybe I should talk to somebody, or I should actually talk to my father about it. So you see, you got a you got a goal there. All right, okay. Um, yeah. Then once we have done that, we what do we do? So you've thought you've helped them with the thoughts. Next, what you're doing is you're helping them handle those emotions, those emotions of pain, disappointment, anger, fear, all of that. You're helping them understand those emotions, right? So when you help people with emotions, um, often we are all taught to suppress our emotions, right? What are we asked to do? Don't get angry, don't cry, don't complain, don't, uh, you know, don't cry. That's what we are told to do. Or our, our upbringing becomes like that, or even our culture comes like that. But in the depth of every problem is a deep-seated emotional component. Right? You think of your own lives. When you have a problem, there is a deep emotion there, right? If that emotion wasn't so strong, then it doesn't become a problem. You can actually think about it and deal with it, isn't it? Right? Like, for example, um, so let's say a problem like, I can only think of problems with children. Okay. <laughs> so let's say the problem with, with the child is maybe your child is uh, got uh, hasn't done well in school. Okay? If you're not very emotional about it, what is it you will logically think? You'll say, okay, my child needs help. Maybe I should get him for tuition or change the subject, something. So you have a very logical understanding, right? It doesn't become a problem because you've already thought about it or you can come with a solution. But let's say that your child misbehaved in class and you get very angry. Do you think the solution comes as easy? It may not, because there is so much of uh, emotions that are behind the problem. So unless and until we deal with that emotion, we may not be able to come to a place of solving a problem. Get that? Prince, you're looking very lost. What happened? <laughs> Explain it again. OK, so I'm saying when an emotion is related to a problem, and usually, so the example that I gave, you're, uh, um, you're very upset about your child misbehaving. All right? So when you're angry or when you are sad, a solution doesn't come out as easy. Why? Because your emotions are clouding your mind. Right? It overtakes your logic. Okay? So you have to help somebody with their emotions first before you can actually help them come with a solution. All right? Here we got bothered about the box. He's bothered about the box. 
the child is not bothered about marks. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So whatever the problem is, if you have, if the emotions are coloring your mind, uh, solving doesn't happen very easily. All right? It doesn't happen very easily. That's why people who are extremely anxious, who have anxiety, even small things becomes a huge thing for them that they can't they can't do anything because that the uh, the anxiety is so much that something like even yeah so something that can be done very easily for someone who doesn't have anxiety they can't do why because the emotion has clouded their minds right so the first and foremost thing is to help them with the emotion to get them to identify and understand their emotion. Yes. Still, something they claim. In this example, we saw that child that we know that we should the parent got to know that child failed in exam. Obviously, he will feel uh, sad. Yes. But, but still, he had a solution. Even though he has some emotions hmm. attached to those situations, hmm. he, he, he figured a way right. So, it, yeah, so that's what it, it really matters from person to person, right? Now, I may be very worried about my child getting bad marks. You may not be. No. <laughs> okay, so you may not be. But that means I have to first and foremost deal with my emotion. Maybe you you can think maybe you're sad or maybe you're upset, but then you can you can do it quicker. But what I mean to say is in every problem that a person comes, we cannot sideline an emotion. You have to deal with the emotion, help them to deal with the emotion. That's why, you know, when when Dennis comes to you. If you're not going into the deeper level of the emotion, you're not going to be effective because you will finally say, Dennis, you go for rehabilitation, you don't become a rock band, get into classes without actually knowing the deeper truths of it. right? Because now you've identified the deeper truth, you know how angry or how uh, sad or how upset he is because you've identified it. So every problem that comes to you, you have to go to that level of emotion. Remember, we said the five levels of functioning, physical, emotional, rational, volitional, spiritual. So this emotional part of it, can, see, we are very complex beings, right? Our emotions don't work in isolation. It always has a contribution from some area of your life, isn't it? Like, for example, if you don't sleep well, you will tell, but the next morning, are you going to be very nice? No. Or you don't eat. Will you be angry? Hungry will cause you angry. Right? So your physical affects your emotions. Or you had a fight with someone at home. Does it affect your emotions? Yeah. Right? Or um, uh, what are the other things? Uh, uh, ah, how you think. Right? You have a test today and you're thinking, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. Is it going to make you fearful while you're right? See, so you see, your emotions never are in isolation. It doesn't function on its own. It has these contributions. So that's exactly what we're saying here. Helping them deal with those emotions because the fact that the very fact that he's drinking alcohol in itself causes a person to be very uh, angry or even depressed, right? He's not having a very good relationship with his father. Too many expectations. It causes emotions. There are problems in his environment in college. Nobody likes him or the professors don't like him, right? It causes his dreams are not being fulfilled. It causes an emotion. Maybe his walk with God is very, very far away. He doesn't even know who God is. 
it affects your emotions. So you see that? So emotions are important to handle. And so that's what you would do to help them handle and deal with their negative emotions, not just now, but also in the future. So not just in this situation, but in the future. How do we do that? And I think this is a lesson for all of us, right? The first and foremost thing is to label your emotion. Ask yourself, what am I feeling? What am I feeling right now when I have this problem? And, and, and that's what you would do with the counselor. Uh, you know, how do you how are you feeling? What what are you going through at this point if you're not able to gauge? And that's why we that's why responding to feelings is very important. You know, I understand that you are very angry with your father. Right? So he's saying, yes, I am. So you get to know, okay, there is anger. So face and label the emotion. Help the person to say, I see that you're angry. It makes you really angry. So he's saying, yes, I am angry. So you see, you see that he's actually facing it. He's labeling his anger. Okay. Then you discover how, why did that anger come about? What is the source of the anger? Or what is the trigger of the anger? So he may say, I'm really angry because my father has never has high expectations of me. He never has heard what I want. He only wants things and I have to follow it. So I'm really angry and I want to take revenge. So you have the source of the anger. And then help him express it. It is important to express that anger. Right? So that they, you give them a free expression of their emotions. All right? Now, when they're expressing their anger, it can make us feel uncomfortable. How many of us feel uncomfortable when somebody cries? All of us feel, no? In some way, just say, oh, you finish fast. <laughs> you know, can I bring you a coffee? We'll go I eat an ice cream, right? But to help express emotions. So they may cry, they may weep, they may get angry, they may bang their heads, their hands, whatever but help them express their emotions. That's one goal that's extremely important to get people to do. Okay? They're banging their head loud. Uh. Okay, so... Okay, tell me how. Already got like okay, you cry for some time and later we can go out. Okay. It's like kind of anger and they kind of throwing things on cutting themselves. We can't also just uh, they may not cut in front of you. That they won't do. They won't cut in front of you. And watch. Huh? So okay, so suppose someone is banging their head in front of you. What will you do? Prince, what will you say? Okay, as a counselor, you may not be able to do that. <laughs> okay. Mm. So, some things that I've found helpful is, especially when they are, I mean, I've never had an experience when they are, uh, you know, so, no, never that way. Maybe they will, they are uh, incessantly crying. That's all the experience. I've never had anyone who's been extremely aggressive. But in case they are, one of the things that you can do is, no, <laughs> don't ask a question there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's not when. So when someone is expressing an emotion, you want to be understanding. So you, you could say something like, you know, I know how distressing this is for you. And I can see it. Right? And if you want them to stop, you can say, may I hold your hand? You know, if it is a, if it's the same gender, you said, can I hold your hand? Or you can offer, uh, would you just like to just, you know, be calm for some time. Can I get you some water? Can I, uh, would you like, would you, how would you like me to help you? Right? Just ask. If you don't know what to do, ask. Right? So it is, let them finish that emotion. Allow them to finish it. Don't start questioning and will this help you? That's not the time to do that. Right? Just give them that space to emote. Because nobody gives people space to to actually emote. You know that? 
nobody does to let go of that frustration that anger right so allow them to complete whatever they are expressing yeah Ah. Okay. They call so my classroom is here. There's function. So sometimes they call me. I don't know the person to call them for me. So what I'm going to do the first is he's he's I think he's seven years. Some some of his time he's very like, very smart, right? And he's sitting like as this in front of counselor. He starts hitting at all the windows. So in case of that, I know how he is talking. So they call me for me. Holding. Help. Uh, holding, uh, the boy. holding the boy back. Uh, okay. So. Uh, <laughs> actually, actually to... <laughs> uh, so the, uh, again, you, you know, when, when you bring examples like this, there can be very many reasons why someone does that. One can be an emotional response. Secondly, it could be, it could be a different difficult behavior. Like especially when you come to children and all of that, there can be manipulative behavior or they can be, um, uh, they, it's called dissociative behavior. There are different kinds of behaviors that people may exhibit at that point of time, you know, depending on the situation. So the first and foremost thing that you need to ensure, especially if someone's hitting their head, is to make sure that they don't hurt themselves, right? Because if they hurt themselves, that's going to be trouble. So doing the best that you can to calm that. So in case that doesn't happen, like we said, we may need to hold or you know get support to move them away from that situation. Like especially when, when people get uh, too aggressive, right? You may need to set it, set them apart. Like on the road, you've seen when people get into fist fights. You can't talk them and say, calm down, none of that. You may have to pull them away from the situation, right? For them to actually kind of calm down. So it depends on each situation. So if you have a client like that who is so aggressive and, you know, hitting head and bleeding and all that, you may need to bring, move them out of that place and, you know, soothe them, bring them, say, okay, you know, yeah, it's okay. I'll let, calm down. I'm here with you. We'll you know relax let's we can talk about it just calm down first you know so you may need to do some of those strategies so one size doesn't fit all you'll have to try different things okay all right okay so once we have helped them handle uh, um, so first we said beliefs second we said is the emotions then what you're going to do is to help them to make changes in the different areas of their lives. So you are getting them to make changes in what all areas? In their, maybe in their physical area, in their um, 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 emotional, which is what we did earlier, in their thinking, in their uh, uh, volitional, and in their spiritual. So what are you what are you doing? You're helping them make that change that reflects their new understanding. Okay. So uh, so what you're doing is let's say maybe in the physical part of it, you're encouraging them to take care of their body, because with alcohol, what's happening here? There's a lot of damage that's happening to the body. So your the goal is to help them to change maybe physical. Um, uh, patterns of of their drinking okay so that's the one area the second is emotion which we spoke about rational we again spoke about the thoughts third is volitional that to help them know that they are the ones who make the choice of how they want to change their lives like so dennis makes the choice of how he can change his life and last one is spiritual where you bring them to that awareness of their security, their self-worth, and their significance. So this, what you're doing is what we spoke about earlier. You are getting them to reflect on how their new understanding will affect their physical, their emotional, their rational, their volitional, and spiritual. Right. So these are all conversations that you will have. Um, through this process, it's all about goal setting. Goal setting is you are 
figuring out what are the areas that need to be changed. All right, so we've said about uh, your emotions, your thoughts, the physical area, the choice one makes, and the deeper needs. All right. Once this is done is when you move into the next stage, which is the stage of action. All right. Now, remember that it doesn't go, like I said, you know, it doesn't, it's not watertight compartments. You finish exploration, then understanding, then action. Maybe the first goal is just to, um, uh, just to uh, change his thoughts. All right. So maybe that's the only goal that he has, probably. So then you get into action on that first and foremost. Right? So then you plan, you work with him as to how is he going to change his thoughts? What is he going to do to change his thoughts? Or it may be to deal with his alcohol. He says, no, I want to deal with my alcohol. I want to change this. So maybe it is finding out rehabilitation. So you get into that action. And then you come back. Once that is done, you come back and deal with the other things. So it's not that, OK, in goal setting, everything, you discuss all the five areas, and then in action, you go do all the five. It doesn't happen like that. So it may be one, one by one, OK? Now, in the action, the first thing that you are doing is you are going to start the intervention. You're going to begin that process of intervention. So if there is an intervention, you have to identify what are the steps to reach the goal. So he says, I want to get rid of my alcohol. So what are the specific steps that you need to do to get rid of alcohol? All right. So when you're doing that, when you are dealing with goals, have you, have you, uh, do you know smart goals? Have you all read smart goals? What is on the what is on the slide? They're called smart goals. Okay. Smart goals are the way that you attain something. So your goals always need to be specific. So what is the specific goal here? I want to get rid of alcohol. It's a specific goal. It's a measurable goal, which means uh, after some time, I will know whether I have left alcohol or no. You can measure it. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Achievable. It's something that you should be able to achieve. It shouldn't be so large that it is unable to achieve. Like he's saying, okay, from tomorrow I'm going to become a rock star. It's not achievable right now. Okay. R is realistic goal. So what is the first step to get rid of alcohol? Maybe, maybe um, call a few rehabilitation centers or go to a doctor first. That's the first realistic goal. And T is time bound. There should be a certain time for the goal. When would you like to see that goal achieved? Okay, so that's what we call as smart goals. So when you're formulating a goal, it should be specific, it should be measurable, it should be achievable, it should be realistic, and it should be time bound. Okay, so once you identify, you take appropriate steps. Now, as an example, okay, so what are the steps that Dennis is taking? Is to join, uh, so his goal is to stop drinking. Okay, his goal is to stop drinking. So, what are the steps he will join a rehabilitation program? Right, he will join a group. AA is called Alcohol Anonymous, where uh, where you know people who have a problem with alcohol meet together in a group to get support. So, what group would he join? All right, how will he handle stress? That's the next. Uh, step. Why? Because sometimes when stress comes is when he may be drinking. So you have to handle that, right? Or um, in if, rather than going to drink, what can he be involved in? Maybe it's a sport. So what hobbies or joining a sports club? Or how does he want to spend weekends? Right? So these are all steps towards stopping to drink. You get that? So these again, so when he says, I want to stop drinking, so the question that I may ask is, OK, so if there were the first two steps you could make to stop drinking, what would be the initial few steps? So then he may come up with some of this. I mean, we've just I've just kind of put it up just to give you an idea about what are the steps that can be, that can that you can do forward. OK? All right, clear? OK. Now, the next goal will be to 
let's say it is to change his thought. Maybe that's the second goal he had, to change my thought. So how would he do that? So first and foremost, it may be helping him to write the negative thoughts down. Whenever you're having these thoughts, write it down. And what can we replace it with? Maybe replace it with the truth of God's word or replace it with, not with a lie, but with some truth. Like for example, let's say he's not a believer, all right? And he says, I'm not good for anything. So is that a wrong belief? Yes. What is the belief that, you know, so, and that's something you can ask him. What would you like to change it with? When you know that this belief is not helping you, how do you want to change the belief? What do you want to say? So he may say, I want to believe that I, I have some capability. I have some ability, right? It may be just truth that you can help them. So that is the second goal in order to change the uh, to change your thought. Okay. All right. I'll go on the next to after in the next class because I think we just have around three, four minutes. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Francis. Uh, so, uh, not affected the scales. Ah. Uh. Well, when we have less now, we can counsel, right? Therefore, I will come up with people. But I, if, if, if any person is mental counseling and the day, the counselor said he can do, do, do. But this guy who is having alcohol, he said, like, like, he, I, he he? Said, like, like I want to um, stop this alcohol. Oh. As a guy, he said, like, he, that is a lie, what he said. He wanted to stop the alcohol. Okay. And he went, he, went and drank again. Yeah. Ah. So, ah. how is this like he can overcome that? Because he went to the counselor and counselor said, like, he can do like this, but he's not able to do that. Mm. He's going again to the alcohol. That's okay. That's all right. But how, how, do, how he can um, overcome that? So, see, overcoming a problem is a process, right? Overcome any problem is a process. Like we spoke about something last week, no? Did it change fully? No. So it's a process, right? So we need to, we continue to make that conversation. So maybe if I were to have a session with you, I would ask you what worked last week, what didn't work, right? Why didn't the uh, start, you said something, you said a sweet and, you know, have somebody poke you or something that you said, right? Why didn't that work? What, what, what happened? Those strategies didn't work. I said, no, they didn't work because I said, okay, so let's develop some new strategies. So it's a process. So all because some your counselee doesn't do or doesn't come with, you're not a failure. Remember, that's their struggle. And you are working with them to overcome that. But the problem happens when you think, I am responsible for Francis to focus. I'm not responsible for you to focus. I am here to help you, right? And to show you that even when you have a relapse, relapse is when someone goes back to alcohol or a drug, that it's okay that I'm here to accept you and work through it, right? So you shouldn't as a counselor any time feel that you are responsible for your counselee becoming well. You're not, right? You are only a facilitator. You're only someone who's showing the way. Got that? All right? So. Don't feel that are you that person drank, that means I'm also useless. Uh, that's a that's a terrible thing. I mean, you know, you're there to help. So when they are not able to think, you can't also say, Are you I can't do anything, please go find another counselor. No, you work with them because there is something that hasn't worked. And you found out what hasn't worked. In fact, it's a positive thing that your sweets didn't work and someone pushing you, it didn't work. It's a good thing, it doesn't work. Right? What else can we figure out? What else can we find out? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's uh, take a break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back.